when you receive Jesus and when you accept what he did on the cross to give us new life, right? It wasn't just to take us from hell to, to deliver us from hell to go to heaven, but to give us new life and new creation in Christ Jesus. But that, that happened. When you got baptized in water, you decided to put to death the old nature and come back out of the water into the new nature, putting on Christ. He, then you get baptized in the Spirit, and He wakes up your spirit, and you become alive. That's why He says those who do not follow Him are dead. That's why He said, let the dead bury the dead, and you come follow Me. So Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So He brings life to who you were really born to be by God. But then, so that's done. But then comes the us renewing our mind to learn how to walk this out. And Jesus did pay for us to be free from sin. And I want to do something today. I want us to talk together. Say free from sin. Do you know that? Do you believe that he actually paid for us to have that? Yes or no? You know, what I was taught when I became a Christian, I was taught we're all going to sin. We're all going to sin. It's okay. We're all going to sin. But I couldn't find that in the Bible. He never says we're all going to sin in the New Testament. He says if we sin, you have an advocate with the Father. So there was a wrong mentality understanding, and I'm thinking, and then when I try to say this and bring that out to some people that know, like preachers and friends of mine, things like this, and talk about it, they get defensive, and they're like, are you saying you don't sin? And I'm like, I'm not saying, I'm not glorifying if we fail or not fail. I'm saying, can we? Does the Bible teach that we can walk in a place where we don't sin anymore? And they, it's like a shock thing. No, you can't talk like this. We're all human. That was the first mistake. We're not human. If we've been born again, and then we says we're a new creation in Christ Jesus, now we're in, a, in a, the human body, but we're a new creation in the spirit, living in this human body. And if we don't understand what happened and then start practicing to live out what happened, we will not walk in the new creation freedom that it does, you are completely free from sin. And many times we try not to sin, but I want to show you, I found the verse in the Bible that answered everything. This verse tells you how you can walk around, according to the Word of God, without sinning anymore. Do we want to know this answer? First of all, is it possible, yes or no? You have to make that up in your mind first. Do you believe that's possible? I had a preacher one time say, uh, you're saying you without sin, you're probably sinning right now. He goes, no, he said, I'm probably sinning right now. I'm thinking, you become born again then, man. What are you talking about? I'm probably, you don't know that you're sinning? What are you talking about? We know what we're doing. We know what we choose to do. I'm not saying we don't fail. I failed as a pastor, before a pastor, when I became a Christian, many times in everything, in thought, deed, everything, right? But I'm not going to glorify that lifestyle. I'm not going to say that it's okay because I failed. We're not going to boast at, and speak about more how we, got, we have grace and mercy because we're failing all the time. It's not about boasting in that. I want to boast in what did he do? What did he achieve for me to walk in? And I want to walk in that breakthrough that even if it feels like I'm doing that alone or it sounds like it's impossible, like everybody tells me it's impossible, but yet God says all things are possible with him. Yeah, he says to a prostitute, listen to this, they're about to stone her, remember? And he covers her to block, defend her from being stoned to death because she did what was wrong. She was caught in the act. 100% the evidence is there. She should be stoned to death according to the law. And he turns around and, and stops them from doing it and then turns to her and says this, where are those who accuse you, who condemned you? She goes, there's no one, Lord. Because he said, You're, anyone who has never sinned before, you throw your first stone. And they all walked away because they all sinned. And he turns around to her and says, where are they that are going to stone you? She goes, there's no one, Lord. He goes, listen, I don't condemn you either. And he doesn't stop there. He says this, go and sin no more. He's, she should have said, that's impossible. I can't do that. What are you talking about, Jesus? You don't know. We know better than you. Or it's a reality that we can go and sin no more. He says this over and over to people. Go and sin no more lest a, le a worse thing comes upon you. He talks to a blind guy and says this to him. How can he tell him go and sin no more unless he was capable of going and sinning no more? Can Jesus ever lie? 
can Jesus ever put a burden on someone that they can't do? No. So it is possible. And even in 1 John, he says, if you say that you have not sinned, you make God a liar. That's talking about if you ever try to come to God and say, I don't need to be forgiven for sin. That's a lie because we all have sinned and fall short of the glory. And then he says, if you sin, you're from the devil. The same chapter, same book. Which one is it, Lord? You understand? If you continue in sin, you do not know God. Like what? So he's telling us there is a lifestyle of expectation of that. Now, I'm not talking about putting you down, saying, oh, we have to not sin anymore. I'm saying he's told us how to do this. And if we realize, if I, he says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. If I told you this is available and you believe it, faith come will come for it. But if you keep thinking, you can't, you can't, we're all going to sin, blah, blah, blah. There's no faith to walk in a place where you don't sin. You understand? So the first bit is, to do you believe this? And if you do, listen to how he says this. This is the passage. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 17. This is the answer. Many ways. Okay. When someone was sick, right? When they came to Jesus, what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? Just say some stuff. Come on, help me out. Help me out. Someone's sick and they came to Jesus. What did Jesus do? Healed them. All right? If someone had a demon and Jesus was coming towards them and saw them or they brought, a, brought the demon-possessed person to him, what did he do? Cast it out. In, in fact, if you look at the, in the book of Acts where the apostles are going out and doing the same things in the name of Jesus with the Holy Spirit filled inside of them, what happened? In they, like John, he walked, and Peter, they walk up to a guy that was begging for money, and he didn't preach the gospel to them, nothing. He said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. He didn't say to him, you have to believe first. Do you believe? Have you got sin in your life? Maybe you got generational curses. You got generational curses, don't you? That's why you're not getting healed. None of this is in the Bible. In, our, in the New Testament, they never dealt with people in the New Testament this way. Jesus sees someone and the mother's crying because the, the son, the young son died and he has compassion for the mother, goes to the child and says, get up and raises the child from the dead. He didn't ask him, do you believe that you can raise from the dead? He's dead. True? Paul, he's walking in this city, in this town. He's preaching the gospel with Silas, I think it is. And there's this girl that's got a spirit of divination inside of her. She says fortune telling. She says the future. And she was a slave, a servant to, some, to a couple there. She was a servant, a slave into, to a, a couple. And they found out that she can do this. She can do divination. Okay? And what happens is Paul is walking around and Silas, I think it's Silas again. I'll keep, they keep, kept on changing partners. And this girl is following him. And saying, these are servants of the Most High God. Listen to them. Listen to what she's saying. She's the best promoter there is, mate. This is like Facebook marketing 101 right there. She's literally following them. They know her. They come to her to get their fortune telling done. She's very popular. And she would bring a lot of money to the ones who owned her as the servant, as her servant. And she would walk around saying, these are servants of the Most High God. Listen to them. Notice, he says in the Bible very clearly that she was demon-possessed. She had a, a demon of divination. What does Paul do? He's walking, and he, he says he gets sick, sick of it because day by day, she kept on doing this. So he turns around and goes, get out. Rebukes the demon, and the demon comes out. How's that possible? According to our theology, that we do it the long way, it's this. Uh, have you forgiven everybody that you should forgive? And, uh, maybe when you were five, you have to deal with this, and six, when you would deal with that, and with seven, and maybe we have to break off Freemasonry and the generational curses. And did, did, Can you find me one scripture in the New Testament that they dealt with anybody this way? No. So what I'm saying is there was the easy way, the way Jesus and the disciples demonstrated what Christians are capable of to do and how we're meant to respond to someone that's demon-possessed or hurting or needing healing, right? And then through the years, theology brought up these other ways of doing things. Now, it has been beneficial sometimes. It has done some good things, but it's doing it the long way. 
You understand? So in the same way, the way we're dealing with sin, I believe we're doing it the long way. Look, listen to how you're meant to deal with it. And we actually can walk victoriously as we practice this. I'm still practicing this. So I'm on my journey and I'm saying to you guys, this is how we can do it God's way. None of these are five steps to this and six steps to get your breakthrough. Listen to what he says. Did you, yeah. Galatians 5, 16 to 17. This I say then. Ready? Very simple. How we can walk free from sin. Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. ta -da! That was it. Thank you for coming. Good night. That's it. That's it. But I know there's a problem there. Do you know why? Because then the next question comes, well, what is walking in the Spirit? Good question. Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. And then he later, he actually lists all the evil desires. He's talking about the evil desires. He's not talking about eating. That's not an evil desire. We want to eat? Go eat. Jesus was hungry. And he goes up to get the fig, right? So, and he really was really wanted that fig, so he cursed the tree because he wasn't there. I'll keep going. For the lust, for the flesh desires, lust means desires, against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. These are fighting one to another. The flesh is fighting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. How do you conquer it? Go back to the first verse of it, the 16. This is how you conquer it. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We must learn that whole thing now, the way we do this is we practice putting into action this one verse. And it's not quick, that's the problem. We think, oh, it's done, so it should be easy and quick. No, it's retraining yourself now, daily and daily, to take up your cross and follow Him. And I'm going to show you a couple of steps here, how we can do this, how we can start walking in the Spirit, so we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Remember, the flesh wants to take what is sinful. It wants, that's what wants the things that are wrong, okay? So if you walk in, thank you, if you walk in the Spirit, this will not happen. So... Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. What I'm going to do is we're going to speak about this. And then the worship team will come back up. And we're going to worship differently. We're going to worship now with faith activated from what we just heard. Because in the Bible it says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. We're going to talk about the reality of what's there. And then we're going to practice right now walking in the spirit. Okay, and then what you've practiced, do this every day. And as you learn to do this every day, this will become what's more normal. And you'll, you'll know when you moved into the flesh because you practice so much walking in the Spirit. Because it takes time, we give up. Because it's not quick. Where's my McDonald's now? Three minutes. I order it. I want a Big Mac. Da -da -da -da. Within seconds, I drive to the next window. Here you go. That was very quick cooking. I can't cook that fast. We want, Mac we want Christianity to be like this. We want God's answers to look like this. But if he's forming and building up something, it takes time. Just like a tree. If we put a tree planted and then put storm and wind and hail and throw stuff, it can't. It's not strong. It's too weak. It takes time to develop, to become strong. How? Through the things, through life, through Winds and soft stuff happening to begin with until when the hard stuff comes, it gets stronger and stronger and it can handle things. In the same way, that's what you're happening. You're growing up into this tree. That's why it says growing up into all things in Christ. We are growing up still. Okay? And who has seen young children want to act older than what they were? All of us. We were actually probably, you know, like I was. I was thinking, well, you know, can't wait till I'm old. So I was acting older than I was. That's what we're doing with Christianity as well. We become new creation, born again, baby Christians, and we want to act like we want to run and function like it is when you have to learn how to get to this place by daily practice. So, are uh, you there? Galatians 5.25. That's why it's called discipleship. We need to disciple ourselves. We need to be disciplined from God so we can walk and learn and function every day, practice doing the exercises 
in the army, as these guys will know, they wake them up at a specific time and they're doing exercises and all this kind of stuff, same routines, and then they repeat the routine over and over and over until it becomes something that's normal. It's mechanical for them to do it. At the beginning, it's difficult. At the beginning, the whole body doesn't want to do it. You understand? It's the same thing when we become disciples of Jesus Christ. It's discipline to start spending time with Him, discipline to start practicing. How do I walk in the Spirit? Until it becomes our normality, okay? So, what does it say there? If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. It's a massive key there. What is it saying there? It says that we can have the Holy Spirit, but choose not to walk in the Spirit. You understand? So you can be a true born-again Christian, baptized in water, baptized in the Spirit. You have the same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead in you, but you choose not to walk in the Spirit. And what does it say? If you don't walk in the Spirit, automatically there's no middle ground. You're walking in the flesh. And if you're walking in the flesh, you will fulfill the desires of the flesh. You will think like the flesh, the flesh wants you to think. You will give in to what the flesh wants you to give in to instead of what God's Spirit wants you to give in to. So I wrote initial keys, key steps to practice until God's reality and truth becomes your reality. That's what we're going to do right now. So these are initial, basic starting off uh, keys or steps to do to help you starting to walk in the Spirit, okay? So let's look, 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 uh, let's look at them, sorry. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. This is the first things I have to make sure that you know. And we're going to keep repeating this today, okay? Ready? You're going to have to practice every day reminding yourself of this reality. Ready? So Matthew chapter 28 Verse 18 to 20 says this, And Jesus, say Jesus, Jesus, came and spoke to them saying, All power, say all, all power. is given to me in heaven and in earth. Next one. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost. Next one. 20. It's not there. Okay, cool. Let me say the next bit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, watch, hey, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, amen. How, how long, how long would Jesus be with you? Always, say always. We have to get, this is the first step, you have to get that he is with you. Is he with you, yes or no? If he says always, is there a moment that is not with you? Is there a moment? No. So say, Jesus is with me right now. He's not with you just because you're in church or you're in a church service or a gathering or anything else. He's with you even when you go and start washing the dishes or making yourself your frabe or sitting down and watching your favorite show. Is he with you always or not? That's the thing. If you can keep in your mind, keep reminding yourself, oh, he's with me right now that I'm driving, right now that I woke up, right now that I went and brushed my teeth, right now that I'm driving to work, he's with you always. He doesn't have a schedule. Between 9 and 10, I will be with Bobby. Between 20 and 12, I have to go and go with Rich. Always with you. True? If you get this in your head and start practicing this reality, reminding yourself of this, you will act different. Why? Because you're in the presence of someone now and you started believing it. So you're acting different because now you know and you started really believing. Because if you really believed and I really believed that is with me always, would I ever act like some of us might act that we know we shouldn't act? Yes or no? Would you speak to your mother or father, or husband, or wife, or brother, or sister, in a specific way when you have guests there. You know how everyone's well behaved when you have guests in the house? Hi, yeah, mom, thank you, please, yes, wonderful, and you speak real nice, or you're behaved, or whatever. It just depends on the guest. If you really respect them, and you really, you know, you really want to, you know, show honor and stuff like this, you speak well, you do well. Why? Because you're aware of someone that's there. This is the key. If you can really realize he is here with you. Even more, let's get to the next one. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5.
Let your conversation or conduct, behavior, be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, what? I will never leave you nor forsake you. What? How long is never? Is there a moment that he's ever left you? Is there a moment that Jesus has ever left you? What if you were not behaving well and you were really a bad person that week? You did really evil things, right? Did he leave you? Because he doesn't say this. He doesn't say, I will never leave you nor forsake you if you're a good boy. Because if you're not a good boy, I'm going to leave you and forsake you. He never says that, right? You get it? If you realize he's there, this makes you want to change. You really still want to be around me? When you saw the worst junk coming out of mouth, the worst thoughts, Lord, I change me, Lord. And you're talking to him where? You're not going, change me, Lord. You're up there somewhere, Lord. You don't look up. He's with you. Talk to him as if you were going to talk to a friend. If Ziga's right here with me, come here, Ziga. Look how silly we are. We, we act like. He says when two or three are gathered together, he's in the middle of us, Right? He says that he'll never leave me, never forsake, forsake me. He's with me always. And I do this. Ziga is here. And Ziga says, hello. Say hello. hello. Oh, hello, Ziga. Oh, Ziga. Ziga. He's right there. Hey, Ziga, wait, wait, wait. So if we change our mentality, then you stop trying to reach for him, for Jesus, who is right there. Thank you, bro. Good acting. I'm going to make a movie with this guy. You get it? See the simplicity? See what he's done? He didn't want to be away from us. He made sure that he can be as close as possible. And we're going to get to that bit now as well. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. You know, in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, this verse is used so much and it's wrong. He says, Lord, do not take your spirit from me. That's the Old Testament. In the Bible, it says that he will never leave us. The Old Testament, yes, the Holy Spirit was coming and going. Now he will never leave you once he called you. It's us that leave him in our mind. We get distracted easy. And then with our distraction, because we're walking in the flesh, we don't feel God there. And the mind of the flesh says to us, where's God? Why? Because the flesh is against what the Spirit thinks. And the spirit is against what the flesh thinks. So that's telling you where's God. And you're speaking out of that and then fulfilling the desires of what your thoughts and feelings are giving you. And that's why it keeps you trapped. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 16. Know you not that you are what? Temple of God. What is the temple of God? Say another, another word for saying, or say it another way. How would you say, if I say, don't you know that you are the temple of God? Say it to me again, what am I saying about you? Come on, what do you think? Say, say a different word for it. That you are the building of God. Give me another one. The house of God. I like that one the best. Don't you know that you are God's home, house? Yeah, and then we make sure to go, hey, don't you know that you're God's house and what? And that the Spirit of God dwells, lives, doesn't visit, dwells in you. In another place, he says, do you not know that God lives in you? In another place, do you not, he says, do you not know that Jesus Christ lives in you? He makes sure that you know that all of them are living in this house called you and me. All of them are living in Ziga, in me, in my wife Marina, in you, all, every single one of us has the fullness of God inside of us. He doesn't want to be away from us. He's right there and he will never leave you, never forsake you. Now it goes even more. He's not just with you. Come here, brother. I will never leave you, never forsake you. I'm with you always. He's in you, even closer than that. Isn't that amazing? That's how close he wants to be and he is with us. So the whole thing is that we renew our mind and learn now to walk in the Spirit. Let me get to the next bit to get to this. Uh, I wrote, it begins, how do we start this? It begins by faith. You know that we're called the children of faith. Let's read this. 
Um, go to Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. This is the big deal. Faith. Faith is not something we see. It's something we believe, even when we don't see it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. This is more powerful now to me. Because he's trying to say not just that he died and rose from the dead. That he's saying this is the message that gets you to enter into something so supernatural it's crazy. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to salvation. Go look up the word salvation. It doesn't just talk about getting saved from hell. It talks about getting delivered, being made whole, being made new. Listen to that. So it is the power of God to being made whole, new, delivered from what is dark to the truth of what God did. To everyone that believes, who gets this? Those who believe, yeah? To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Next one. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. How do you attain it? From faith to faith. This is it. The point is you believe just because you do what he said. What? You're in me. You're with me. You will never leave me or forsake me. The biggest first thing you need to get in your head. Then he says this. As it is written, the just, those who've been justified shall live by faith. We are the children of faith. What is faith then? Let's go to Hebrews. Chapter 13, verse 5. No, sorry. Chapter 11, verse 1 to 6. Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 1 to 6. Yeah, okay. Now, he's telling us what faith is. Now, faith is the substance. Something you can physically touch. Of what? Of things hoped for. Hope there, go look it up, means what you expected. It's not hope as in you wishing for it. I wish it happens. Faith is the substance of what you hope for, what you're expecting. The evidence of the things not seen. It's the evidence, you start getting a substance, a physical manifestation of what you didn't see, but you were expecting to see it. You were expecting that this is true. So you're functioning by this reality. But listen to this. Next. Uh, for by it, by this faith, the elders obtained a good report, meaning the, the old dudes from before had a good report before God. What's the report? Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. So the worlds were not created from nothing. They were created from the unseen, brought into the scene. Okay? Next. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. What that means is he was never told he just decided that this is better. God would like more doing this for him. And because he thought that God would like it, he did it by faith with no one telling him. And it was true. What he believed would happen, he started walking into it by giving a sacrifice to God. Because he walked into his belief system. And that brought a good report towards God. God did it like what he thought he would like. By which the obtained witness that he was a righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaks. Next. By faith, I love this guy, Enoch. The most quick mention of a person, and I'm like in love with this guy, because after the fall of man, he was able to go and pursue God. Even when they're broken and sin came in, he pursued God so much, he says this, for by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Listen to this next verse here. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. This is the first bit. This is how you function in faith. You believe that he is. What? 
He is with you, in you. He is everything that He says He is. You believe it. And this, as you start believing who He is and what He said, you start acting like it. Because you believe it. Once you start acting like He's there with you, then you see the substance of what you were hoping for. And what happens with Enoch? He starts by faith walking with God. I don't even know if he felt anything or if he just decided, never saw God. He decided, I'm going to pursue God. And he starts by faith going for walks and talking to God, not feeling a thing, worshiping Him, spending time with Him. And then out of the blue, God starts meeting with him and then takes him up alive. The first guy that this happens to. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of who? Of them who diligently seek him. How do we seek him? What was the context? By faith. Like Enoch did. That he chose to walk with God by faith. He chose to believe that God was attainable then. Now we have a word, the Bible, that tells us, hey, I'm with you. I'm in you. It confirms the reality that he's never going to leave us. It's things that they never had. And we can take those words, either believe them or not. And as we believe them, right, even if it's a little faith we have on them, it grow your faith by practicing every day the reality that he's there. When you woke up, he's there. When you're brushing your teeth, he's there. When you went to sleep, he's there. When you woke up, everything, when you're going to work, everywhere, he's there. It just caught, we need to not forget him. But I want to say something to you. I wrote the word forget there. Let's, I wrote actually the word ignore. Let's stop ignoring him. And I don't believe <clears throat> that any of us Christians are intentionally ever wanting to ignore our God. So I realized it was the wrong word. And I realized by the Spirit, we don't want to ignore him. We just get distracted. We don't, we don't get taught to go, hey, let's practice trying to keep my consciousness of him through my day as long as possible. And when I get distracted, to capture that and go, wait, wait a minute. Sorry, I forgot about you again today, Lord. I love you. I thank you that you're with me. And just keep practicing and you get better and better at it because you won't give up. You keep practicing and practicing. You won't give up doing your day with him. And then it becomes more normal to do your day with him. It's not easy to begin with. Just like if I told you now, from tomorrow, I'm going to wake you up at 6 o'clock and we're going to do 20 push-ups right when you roll off the bed. You're not going to get up and go, nothing. Roll off the bed. One, two, three. I'm telling you, some of you are going to be like, you know, the one, and you're flat on the, but if we keep at it and keep at it and keep at it, your body's going to get used to it. Maybe you do one and you drop. Maybe you won't even get off the bed. Maybe you'll do two, some of you, maybe three. But I'm telling you, if we daily take seriously learning to walk with God, learning to acknowledge Him in our life, in every moment, in all our ways, acknowledge Him. It becomes our reality more than what's happening, and now you're doing life with God. He was always there, but now you're doing life with God because you're practicing to do life with God. I'll continue. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Yeah? Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Are you seeing this differently now? You see how it's talking about faith? Now, if you look at it from the way I'm explaining, listen to what he's saying. From the way of realizing your faith being that he's there. Examine yourself that you're in the faith. Which faith? The faith that believes that God is in them and for them and with them. Uh, examine yourself whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. Or do you not know yourselves that what? Uh, know that Jesus Christ is where? Say, Jesus Christ is in me. Listen to his point. He said, hey, examine yourself whether you're in the faith. Or don't you know that Jesus Christ is in you? Listen to how he's saying it. Don't you know this, guys? That he's in you. If you get this by faith and start really not allowing it to flee from you, but you make it your biggest intentional thing that you're going to do, everything will change, like I keep repeating. How that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. You know what that says? Except you are disqualified. Except you're actually not even one of the people that's in the faith. That's what he said. Next, uh, sorry, go to finish with, we're getting there. 
Um, where am I? Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Okay, it says, what? Please read it together. Ready? On three. One, two, three. Did you put it? Yeah? All right. One, two, three. Again, for we walk by what? Faith and not by sight. We have to choose. The, I don't understand why God did it this way. I don't understand why Jesus decided that the way you're going to attain me the way you're going to enter into what is available to you is so, through a way that you don't see. You don't touch. But you learn to enter first through by faith, not by sight. And then it will become your reality. It will become real. Why? Because this is in the, it says in the Bible that we open the eyes of our heart. My eyes don't have, sorry, my heart doesn't have eyes. If you go through a telescope or whatever they use, x-ray, they're going to see two eyeballs on my heart. But yet it says that we have the eyes of our heart. He wants us to learn to live by that sight. And that reality becomes more real and live the life here on earth through that reality. Seeing from that perspective and that heart. Him, His reality. I'll finish. I wrote number three. Learn to intentionally be aware of God. Practice not to forget Him through your day. And you will forget him through your day. I do it every day. I forget him. And I'm like, oh, I forgot you all day today. Or, oh, I forgot you. Like, you know, many times I'm, I could be in prayer for hours, right? I could be in prayer for two hours, four hours, three hours. doesn't matter. Five hours, seven hours. When I first quit my business in Australia, poor man, I was waking up 4 o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock. I'm worshiping and being with God. But what I didn't learn to do was this. Leave my room with God. It was like, okay, I did my prayer time, closed the door, life is going on now. But if you will learn to do life with Him, I'm telling you, that's even more important than when you close yourself up because it's easier. What's hard is when you get distracted. If you can learn to pick up your distractions and find God within it and go, no, 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 no. I'm going to do everything with you. Brother Lawrence, go check out Brother Lawrence's video, audio tape. In YouTube, it's called this, the, pra the practice of the presence of God. He didn't understand all the theologies and all that stuff. He knew one thing, that I wouldn't even pick up a straw from the ground without being aware of the love of God. In other words, how much he loves me and that he's there with me. So everything he did, he did it with God. And he was known to emanate God's presence. They, he was known for the presence of God. And all he did was he just did life, everything he did with God. He says, even if I failed, he said, I just picked myself up. I didn't contend myself. Go, okay, God, sorry. I just forgot about you. But thank you for reminding me because even me remembering is you reminding me to remember you. And he thanked him for reminding him to remember him. <laughs> and so in there, he was just gratitude and worship even in that. And he will do the same thing with you and me. We just got to make this our number one desire. If you walk in his presence, in other words, if you walk knowing he's present with you, you will get more words of knowledge, more healings, more anything that you've ever seen before in your life. Why? Because you're so aware of him who is aware of everybody. And now you'll be at the shop and you'll get direct, specific words of knowledge for people because you're so with him. You're not trying to tune in at some section. Okay, now we're going evangelism. Let me get all godly. Let me pray. What do you mean? Live the life. Um, if you are in the presence of somebody you respect and know what they like don't, and don't like, you will behave in the manner making sure uh, you are behaving in a way that is respectful, honoring, and pleasing in their sight. Because you're aware of that they're in the house. By faith, we choose to practice this reality until it becomes our reality that we see, think, and live from. It just takes time and practice. I've said this through the message, but that's it. And what we're going to do right now is this. I'm going to say a, a quick story. I'll just quickly put Colossians chapter 1, verse 26 to 27. 
He says, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to us, his saints. What? To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is in you and this expectation of beauty is going to shine. Because you learn to walk with him. Why? Because he's in you. He doesn't leave you. So learn to be aware of exactly how you would behave if someone knocked on your door or called you because now they're in your presence. Oh no, they're here or they came through the door and you were angry and you changed the way you act now because they're there. They're in your presence. This person that came out from the door, what I said before, do the same thing realizing that Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is in your presence all the time. So how do you act now? You see how everything changes? When you start believing that he's there, he really is there, everything changes in the way you, what are you watching? See, it's not about me telling you now, stop watching those things, stop listening to that stuff. When you, that truth becomes true to you, Jesus is right there. You'll be like, I don't want to watch this, Lord. I wouldn't want to watch, I, I don't want you to be watching this. Everything changes. Everything changes when he becomes your reality. This is how we change. And this is how you will learn to live in the, to walk in the spirit. Because now he himself is here. You're aware of it. So you start walking in the spirit because you don't want to fulfill the last of the flesh because you honor him too much. Knowing that he's right there. He's not visiting. He lives with you. Amen. I will say... I love reading this book called The Vision by Rick Joyner. And in this book, at one stage, Jesus says to him, when you start believing the things you see with the eyes of your heart, this reality, because he's in heaven, he's literally seeing Jesus and he's getting, you know, guided and taken through different things. And he says to him, when you start believing what you see with the eyes of your heart, this, me and this realm will become more real to you than even the earthly realm. That's what I want. In another book I like reading, it's called the, the Heaven Awaits the Bride by Anna Roundtree. And at one stage, she's up in heaven. Okay, she has this encounter. She's up in heaven. And God allows her to speak to these two angels. And these two angels are approaching her. And they look like twins. But one's blonde, one's brown haired. But they look like twins. And they, they're dancing and singing and, 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 and coming along this road or this path in heaven. And there's trees and everything and all that stuff. And then they stop before Anna and they say, hey, Anna. And she says, hi. She says, I says she said, what's your name? She said, my name is Sense. And the other angel's name was Nonsense. His name was Sense. The other one's name was Nonsense. And then she goes, that's weird. He goes, no, because that, that's how God is. Sometimes the things of God make sense. And sometimes they make no sense. And he starts laughing. And, she, and then nonsense says, can, can we sing a song? And then sense, his twin angel, says, come on, you know your songs never make any sense. And he goes, yeah, but you know you love them. I, I won't forget the story. It's playing in my head. Because God spoke to me through it. And he says, okay, go on. And they say, Anna, do you want to sing along with us? She goes, okay. So this was the song. What is it like to live above? What is it like above? Walk blind and you'll see. Walk deaf and you'll hear. That's what it's like to live above. That's what it's like above. That's what it's like to live above. That's what it's like above. Do you understand what he was teaching her? That it doesn't make sense to believe that God is there because he's not there. You don't feel him. It doesn't make logical sense to the logical mind. In the physical world, it doesn't make sense. We sound crazy. So some of the things of God make no sense. And that's what it's like to live above. That's what it's like above. That's what faith is. The substance of the things hoped for, the evidence of what you did not see. So I encourage you guys, right now, get the worship team to come up. And we're going to do, I don't care if it's one song or two songs and you need to go, it's okay guys, okay? There's no, you know, I know you have family and kids and all that stuff. If you need to go, go. But what I want to do is, I want you now to when you worship, you don't do this. I want you to do oceans first and then move to whatever song, okay? I don't want you to lift your hands now thinking that you're reaching towards God somewhere. 
If you're, if you're lifting your hands up, cool. No worries because you're praising him. All right? But don't praise him as if he's far away. Praise him knowing that he's right here with you. If you many times we make the mistake, and I see it, we, we try to persuade God to come. Oh, yes, Lord, come, Lord, come. And I'm like, where did he go? Where did he go? If we're already starting to worship him in the wrong mindset, then we're not really, we're really wasting our energy trying to worship someone up there somewhere where he's saying, I'm right here. You get me? And then you get tired. You feel like, but I didn't feel God. I didn't feel like I'm touching God or connecting with God. Yes, because you approached him unbiblically. You approached him with a false understanding. It's not your fault. You just didn't know. But now that you know, we practice every day going, you're here. You're in me. I love you. Thank you, Lord God, you're with me. Amen? So we're going to spend some time now. I don't want you to strain. I want you to relax. Enjoy the one that's right there with you. It's not your movements that make him come and be with you. He's already here to be with you.